Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to another enlightening session of Modulist Talks. I'm Jose, I'm the commercial director of Modulist, and your host for today's webinar. For those new to our sessions, uh, we bring together design industry experts uh, with the idea to share knowledge, uh, both in person, uh, either at our showrooms across Europe and online through those webinars. Today, we are going to be diving into some unique acoustic considerations in architecture. This is the third talk in our three-part webinar series, and our guest today is Emilie Carayol. She's an acoustician at Cal Acoustics, where they are uh, acoustics uh, consultants for performing arts buildings like concert halls and theaters and opera houses. And uh, Emily will guide you through some of those case studies and will share her practical tips to create successful acoustics for different environments. So let's dive in and I leave you uh, with uh, Emily. So thank you. Thank you, Jose. So what I would like to give you through this presentation is some acoustic considerations in designing architectural spaces, such as schools, offices, auditoriums, and based on our knowledge of performing arts projects. So let's start by taking a look to some of our projects we've worked on. This is a concert hall in Bochum that has a reverberation time of two seconds. This is uh, the Atrium Central in Axel Springs in Berlin, which has also a reverberation time of two seconds. This is the Flagey Studio One in Brussels, a maximum reverberation time of two seconds. Does this information tell us something about the acoustic perception or the acoustic feeling in the space? Well, I guess not really. And indeed, we often use the reverberation time criteria, which is the most well-known acoustical parameter for room acoustics. Why? Because it's an objective parameter that can be easily measured and is relatively constant in the room. But the reverberation time doesn't mean much in terms of acoustic perception in the room without any other information. What would then be the relation between the reverberation time and the acoustic perception in the room? Let's go back to our previous examples and introduce the sound pressure level. If we consider a symphonic orchestra that is playing forte, this would be our source, sound source in the room. We are the receivers and we are sitting sufficiently far away from this source so that the reverberant field is stronger than the direct field. What would be the sound pressure level of this orchestra in the different spaces we've just seen? In Bochum, which has a volume of 14,000 cubic meters, and an RT of two seconds, this reverberant level would be 86 dB. If we look at Flash the Studio with a smaller volume of 2000 cubic meter and the same reverberation time, the sound pressure level of this orchestra playing forte would be 94 dB, which is a bit louder. And if we go to an even smaller room like a music classroom, the reverberant pressure level would then be 104 dB, which is extremely loud. Of course, it would be very challenging to fit a symphonic orchestra in a small room. I agree. But what is important to understand here is that it is sometimes very challenging or even impossible to have a source that is the same sound power level as an orchestra fitting in a, in a volume that small. And at the contrary, if we want to place a symphonic orchestra in a larger volume, such as the one in Berlin, the atrium, we would have a reverberated sound pressure level of 77 dB. So the reverberation sound level gives us a good subjective feeling of what the acoustics in this room would be with this type of source. The sound level doesn't only depend on the reverberation, as we've seen, but also on the room volume. And the volume and the reverberation time are related to the amount of absorption in a room. So we can say that the level of re reverberation depends also on the total amount of absorption in the space. And you have the relations down on this slide. 
So if we talk about absorption, we could say that in Bochum, we have a total amount of absorption area of 1,100 square meters. In Springer, it's 8,000 square meters. And in Flagey, it's 160 square meters. Now, if we take a different type of source, for example, a person that is talking in those rooms, we can see that in a 10 cubic meter room, the reverberant level will be much higher than in a 10,000 cubic meter room, but also much lower than in the previous rooms we've just seen. What we can also read in this graph is that the reverberation time influences the reverberant level in a room. The loudness of a source will be more controlled in a drier environment than in a more reverberant space. This is the difference we can see with the two curves. A small volume with a very high RT will give a bathroom effect, and a big volume with a very low RT would give an outdoor effect. So now, how can we set the correct reverberation time target? Well, we can look into some acoustics such as the DIN standard 18041, which gives a good approach to the recommended reverberation time depending on the volume and on the use of the room. We can see different curves here in the graph, uh, which correspond to different uh, uses. So curve A1 is unamplified music, curve A2 is for speech and conference, curve A2 is understandable for people with hearing problems and A5 for sports. This is a good graph to look into when we want to see which RT target we should have depending on our volume and on our use of the room. So to resume, a good acoustic parameter is the reverb P rev that can be produced in a room with a certain type of sources. It depends on the volume of the room as we've seen before and on the reverberation time or on the amount of total absorption area. And it also depends on the use of this room, on the activity, on the sound power level of the sources we put in the room. A concert hall such as Bochum won't be appropriate to listen to a single person talking without any sound amplification because the sound source power level is too weak for this room volume and the speaker will have to raise a lot his voice to be heard by the audience. And on the other hand, a music classroom won't be big enough to welcome a symphonic orchestra or equivalent sound power source because the sound power of an orchestra is way too strong for this room volume. From this relation, other aspects should be considered in spaces where we can have a lot of people speaking at the same time. Uh, for example, restaurants, atriums, cafes, and possibly extend this analysis in other type of uh, spaces, such as kindergarten classrooms, for example. In all these spaces, it is important, first of all, to avoid high background or ambient noise levels. Why? Because when many people can be talking at the same time, and if the basic and acoustic environment is already loud, the noise levels will tend to get louder and louder as people will have to raise their voices to hear each other. This is called the Lombard effect. And for the listeners, it feel very difficult to have any type of conversation in the room and they will quickly feel exhausted to listen to others and leave the room with a headache. So ensuring a sufficiently low and controlled background or ambient noise level is very important in these kind of spaces. Another aspect is the quality of verbal communication. In one of Rindle's paper, which is Restaurant Acoustics, Verbal Communication and Eating Establishments, he recommends an ambient noise level to stay below 71 dB. 
to ensure this sufficient quality in communication between people in the same group. And in order to have a good quality in verbal communication, Rindle has proposed the concept of acoustic capacity, which defines the maximum number of people in the room, depending on the volume and on the reverberation time to keep this ambient noise level under 71 dB. Now let's have a look to where to place acoustic surfaces in the room to control the sound levels as we've seen before and to provide acceptable acoustic conditions for each type of use. One of the first questions you might have is where should we place the absorption? In theory, uh, as an acoustical approach, it is best to localize the absorption as close as possible to noise sources. But in practice, absorption is usually located where it is the least annoying to have acoustical treatments, which is to say on the ceiling. Is this acoustically efficient? Let's take one of our projects. It's a music in cell in Rheinau in Switzerland. It's an ancient monastery that was converted into a residential for musicians. As the absorption could not be placed on the ceiling, as you can see, the historical ceilings are preserved, uh, we had to find other uh, locations. And these rooms were for music rehearsals, so we needed to put absorption around the sound sources to control the noise levels and offer appropriate acoustic conditions for the musicians. So we've put carpets on the floor and we've put also curtains around the windows, as you can see here. We also have mobile panels on wheels that can be placed wherever needed in the space. This is another type of room, a smaller one, where we have also a carpet on the floor and curtains around the window plus fixed absorption panels on one wall that is adjacent to the window. And here is an, again another one in this same building. We have the same type of finishes, so curtains on the walls, fixed panels on the, wall, on the adjacent walls, carpet on the floor, and mobile panels on wheels. And we also see some radiators here. And actually, these are also absorptive surfaces that were migrated in the radiator spacing. Here is the main music room uh, with acoustic finishes uh, on all walls. We have translucent curtains on the two side walls, as we can see on this picture, and a full wall with uh, designed textile panels. And behind these panels, this, behind this textile, we have absorption and reflections. So we have absorptive materials and reflective surfaces. It's not a fully absorptive uh, wall. And on the wall that is behind us, when we look at this picture, we also have the same type of panels, which are half absorptive and half reflective. And then we can see also some mobile panels on wheels that can be located wherever needed in the room, depending on the orchestra and musician layout. So here you can see that the absorption was always placed on the walls, typically on the lower part of the room, and sometimes on the floor to be close to the sound sources, especially close to the instruments with high sound power levels, such as brass, percussions, and piano. The result was highly appreciated acoustically. The noise levels were controlled and the sound levels between instruments was balanced which is important for an orchestra. And also, the room was alive. There was a reverberance coming from the top of the room, which gave a feeling of space above our heads, contrary to a wind and the complete feeling that was felt by the musicians before the renovation. Here it's another project where we also have absorption located on the walls with the curtains and on the ceiling. The ceiling is a stretched, unperforated fabric, which, have, which has half uh, of the surface, well, 30% of the surface with mineral wool, and the other part of the ceiling is only plasterboard, so reflective. The curtains here can 
be also bunched or deployed depending on the actor in this room. And as you can see, the surfaces are never totally absorptive or reflective. Another aspect we have in this room, room is the inclined walls that are never parallel to each other. This is to avoid flutter echoes. So reflective surfaces are also important in room acoustics. In concert halls, reflective surfaces enable good communication and listening conditions between source and receiver. And in common spaces, a similar approach could be effective. But in practice, these reflective surfaces, which are beneficial for early reflections, are rarely used in common spaces. And we often find parallel reflective walls or floor and ceiling which generate weird acoustic effects in the room. In Bochum, for example, you can see on the right side of this slide, the reflections from the balcony, the balcony front that go from the stage back to the musicians on stage. And on the image below, you can see also these balcony fronts, which send the, so the sound from the stage to the audience. You can also see the effectiveness of the canopy above the stage. If we take a section on this balcony front, we can see the efficiency of the side reflectors for the cross communication between musicians on stage and especially for the string sections. In this 3D ray tracing, uh, uh, we can see the election coverage for a source located on stage here. And thanks to the optimized sidewalls of the parterre, we have this coverage over the stage and the audience with early reflections. We can also see here that corner reflections can be acoustically efficient to redirect the sound towards the audience and the stage. Here we can see acoustic optimization of the rear bulk walls and overhang. Spaces. Uh, inclined reflective surfaces are also useful to avoid weird acoustic effects in rooms, such as flutter echoes, as we've discussed earlier, modes, focusing, and late reflections. Indeed, these effects tend to create a longer reverberation time in some frequency bands, which unbalances the acoustic response of the room. And as we've talked earlier on as well, increasing the reverberation time can also increase the overall reverberant level in the room. Here we have another project where we have uh, reflective surfaces waking up the room. The sound source, which is the speaker standing up on the right image, and the receptors are the listeners around the room, they are all in the bottom part of the volume. And the aim was to keep a chapel effect in this project. So what did we do? We played on the side walls. And as you can see, having parallel walls or walls inclined towards the floor makes the energy stay in the lower part of the room. Whereas when we tilt these surfaces upwards, we start waking up the full volume and also putting down the sound pressure level in the lower part of the, vo of the volume. Now, we are going to go through more specific uh, common spaces and see how we can apply these acoustic specifications in there. So where should we locate these acoustic surfaces? Ideally, close to sound sources to control the noise level or to direct the sound towards the receivers. These acoustic surfaces should also be placed on parallel reflective surface to avoid unwanted echoes. They could also be uh, placed on concave surfaces if they are focusing. And another important aspect is the distribution of these acoustic surfaces in the room volume which should be located on the three axis of the sound propagation path. 
Acoustic surfaces should be on walls and ceiling or floor to create a homogeneous and comfortable acoustic environment. Then what type of acoustic surfaces can we propose? Well, we've seen in the previous examples that we could use optimized reflective surfaces to direct the sound where needed. We can also use fixed absorption, which should be evenly distributed in the room, ideally not absorption on one wall or ceiling. And we could also use variable absorption, which could be integrated in the design of the room to adapt the acoustic environment to the different uses if needed. If we look at this kindergarten school, uh, we can have a lot of kids talking and shouting at the same time. When we visited this room, actually, the noise levels were really loud and the measured reverberation time was only 0.9 seconds. But why was, was it so loud in this room? Well, first of all, as a simple uh, visual uh, investigation, we can see that all the surfaces are reflective and parallel. So it doesn't help to control the noise levels. When looking deeper into the recommended reverberation time for this room volume, it appeared that the reverberation time was a bit too high and it should be more around 0.6 seconds, which means that there was some absorption and this absorption was about 25 square meters. Where can we put this absorption then? Well, here we see that the walls and the floor are very um, difficult to, to be used for other treatments because they are already used. The ceiling seems to be free. If we put 100% of absorption in the ceiling, we want energy coming back from this surface. So it's an option, but it wouldn't be the recommended one. We could, for instance, have the perimeter that is absorptive as you and keep the center of the ceiling reflective which would help good communication between the source and the receivers. And the absorption around the room, the ceiling perimeter would help to control the reverberant level in the room. We could also have the contrary, having the center ceiling absorptive and the sides, the perimeter of the ceiling reflective. And this would also be beneficial because we could have the corner reflections helping the listeners and the speaker in the room. For the example of the classroom earlier on, we should also have some absorptive treatments down, lower down on the, on the walls or integrated in the furniture to help lower the noise levels where the sources are. If we continue on this uh, aspect, here is another project where uh, acoustically optimized surface throughout the space. The ceiling is here half absorptive with the perforated plaster and half reflective in the center. And you can see that the sound projected from the source goes to the, rec to the receivers thanks to, to these re reflective surfaces. Having a full surface treated with absorption would kill completely the feeling of the space in this room. Here is another example. We are in an auditorium. The speakers are on the floor and the audience is in the, in the seating area. And we can see different treatments in this room. We have absorption distributed uh, all over the volume, on the side walls, on the ceiling, and the seating audience, which is also absorptive. And we have reflective surfaces that help to project the sound from the speaker to the listeners and that also help to have a feeling of the space. The absorptive treatments are the curtains that you can see on the facade. We have slotted wood with mineral wool in the ceiling. We have sintered aluminum on the side walls and we have absorption with the audience seating. In 
another type of space, such as open plan office. Uh, what could we do here to avoid disturbance and to control the noise levels? Well, we could put some absorption on the ceiling. For example, above the tables, which is close to the sound sources. This would reduce the noise levels around the table, but could still enable sound to propagate from one table to another, as you can see with the green arrow. We could then add architectural elements, which are reflective, and that could redirect the sound towards each group. For example, these baffles, reflective baffles that are uh, um, drawn on this sketch. These reflections would be helping the people to hear their voices on each table and also avoid the Lombard effect because the sound wouldn't be traveling throughout the space. And here you can see that the sound transmitted from one table to another would only hit absorptive surfaces. So the noise levels would be better controlled. If you want to add a bit more visual privacy or helping people to concentrate on each group, you could also add some curtains or some mobile furniture as drawn in blue in this sketch. Finally, look at, take a look to this uh, project that we've seen earlier on. And we see that this volume is very big and we have a lot of sound sources in the same volume. It could have become a very big nightmare if the river burnt level were not controlled and the space is not treated acoustically. What is integrated here is a lot of acoustic absorptive surfaces that you can see written on this uh, slide. We have micro perforated metal, perforated metal with absorption, acoustic stretch ceiling. You also have open metal mesh with mineral wool behind or bands of absorption integrated in the concrete. We don't have only absorptive treatments. We we also have reflective surfaces that are optimized to constant levels. And this is thanks to these facades, which are tilted towards the ceiling, which is partially absorptive. A sound that hits this facade is then hitting the ceiling, and so being partially absorbed. This is a good example for, of a big volume with multiple sound sources which are not disturbed by their neighboring environments. Thanks to appropriate acoustic surfaces located throughout the space, this large space is well suited to the uses needs in the project. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Emily, for this uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, we still have uh, some minutes now to answer some of the questions that we have received uh, in the chat. So if that's okay with you, Emily, I'll, I'll throw them at you. Yep. So we have a question here that says, uh, how can architects collaborate effectively with acousticians to achieve the desired results in terms of uh, acoustics? It's a very good question. Um, it should be taken from the beginning. I mean, as we've seen in this presentation, the volume is very important and has to be suited to the needs of the project. So already from the beginning, we should aim to have the right volumes for the type of uses we, we try to have. And then from there, then on, we can have the intention of the architect and the needs for the acoustics and try to integrate them together so it doesn't look like two separate elements at the, at the end, but integrated um, constraint, if we want, or integrated uh, perspectives in this project. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, we have something else coming. Uh, what are the common challenges that acousticians uh, face where they are designing for the optimal acoustics in different environments, different spaces? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I'm not sure to have understood. Yeah, what are the challenges that you, as ac acousticians, you, you face when you are designing for the optimal outcome uh, for different environments? What sort of yeah. challenges you face? Uh, 
Well, um, sometimes we are uh, constrained because uh, we need to integrate some acoustic uh, treatments that can be reflective or absorptive. And it doesn't always go with the architectural uh, intention. Mm -hmm. And so we need to find the right, uh, right aspect to put in this uh, space to make it work. And so it's a big discussion of trying to find, can we maybe use acoustics with other, uh, other elements such as thermal aspects or we could have lighting aspects as well. Everything can be combined and it shouldn't be separate elements that we need to put in a room, but a combined solution uh, to avoid having too many different uh, little bits for of everyone. I uh -huh. don't know if I'm making myself clear. No, I think it's, it's, it's clear that uh, working as a, as a whole in a coordinated uh, way. So thank you. Um, I think we, we are just there. So this webinar session now is uh, come to an end. So thank you very much, Emily. Uh, as I said, fascinating stuff and uh, information to, to consider. Um, for everyone uh, joining, all the details about these talks, uh, including the access to the recording of today's uh, talk, will be sent uh, to you via email. And uh, yeah, looking ahead, we continue with our series. We're excited now to announce uh, our upcoming webinar series based on circularity and with a special focus on uh, green building practices. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Emily, once again, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next webinar. Thank you.